Engineers, what's something that's designed into a machine solely because of the stupidity of human beings? Viewer's edition. Story one. So I created an HTML application with a CSS progress bar. This app did absolutely nothing. It was just an endlessly looping progress bar that would appear on the customer screen so these dumb butts could see something happening. On the back end, I put in a customizable timeout function you could set as a parameter, invisible to the customer on the actual work scripts. If the customer said, I just need this done real quick, thanks, timeout equals zero milliseconds, and we'd be done in a couple of minutes. If the customer got on the phone and started stressing how catastrophic the issue was and how nobody could solve it, I knew they wouldn't be satisfied that we had done our due diligence in two or three minutes. So timeout equals 720,000 milliseconds, and we'll call them back in two hours to let them know it's done. The same scripts run, same work was accomplished, but we'd make them wait for a resolution so they didn't call back to complain about us. Complaints drop to almost nothing, at least as pertains to the quality of our work. They still complain about our bill, <laughs> and it's not billed hourly, so I don't feel bad about it. So the placebo effect is real, alleviating the pain in my butt every time. I don't mind saying this, as the company was sold off after I left, so things are probably run differently now. I'm well beyond any non-disclosure agreement, which I incidentally never signed, and they screwed me anyway, so screw them. I have a much better job now for a much better company, and this type of tactic is nearly ubiquitous with all help desks. If you panic and make a big deal out of a trivial problem, everyone will pay their time to make it seem like it was more difficult than it really is, just so you can feel validated and they can cover their butts. If you're more relaxed and actually trust the people you pay to do a job to actually do that job, things will get done a lot quicker. Just chill out and everything gets fixed a lot easier. Oh, and another example. If you want to know why most remote connection software changes your desktop wallpaper when someone is connected to your machine, it's because there is a shocking amount of hardcore gay corn used as desktop wallpapers that the technicians don't want to see. Probably one in every 50 machines we connected to had a dong pick as the wallpaper, and each technician was servicing 25 to 50 machines a day. That is the only reason your wallpaper goes black when people connect to you. The ubiquitous feature exists for no other reason than people don't want to see geriatric penises. When asked, technicians will make up other excuses for why it does that, but the real reason is penises. Lots and lots of penises. And I almost forgot, we made another placebo app, kind of as a joke, Digital Holy Water. A lot of older customers, especially in the Bible Belt, seriously do attribute things like malware to demonic possession of their PC. I'm seriously not joking. It wasn't an everyday occurrence, but anyone working there for longer than a few months would have gotten at least one of those calls. The devil's gotten my computer. Help! We wrote them off initially as prank calls. They were serious, though. So we made a version of my progress bar that had a crucifix on it, and the idle text that explained what step it was on was replaced with prayers we found via Google. Just copied and pasted in. It didn't do anything different. We just wrote it as a joke on our break after receiving yet another one of these calls. But one of the junior techs got a call and actually ran it on a customer's PC, which we had never actually intended for it to be run on. And before we knew it, the customer had told their church group and we got even more of those calls. This was bad for us. If the higher-ups found out, we'd have been fired. PC exorcism wasn't a service we actually offered. And since they were paying for the service, it borders on fraud. We never made any false claims, but it would not have been a good look for the company. So we did damage control after work. I wrote a new malware removal script in the same style, but added features like switching them to a corn-blocking DNS address, changing to a Christian-friendly search engine by default, etc., along with removing and blocking the top 200 common malware packages of the day. The script actually worked, albeit in a limited fashion, and we dumped it online as freeware and just pointed people there if they asked about it, but made no claims that it was our app. We should have monetized it. It got like 100,000 downloads. I probably would have made more from that than I did the actual job. But profiting off of that would be a little too sleazy for me. It was just supposed to be an inside joke. So yeah, lots of features in technology only exist because people are stupid. Dare I say most features only exist for that reason. For every line of code that does something useful, there are 200 that prevent the user from doing something stupid. Story 2. Key thing to remember about safety features is that odds are that they exist because before they existed, someone killed or badly injured themselves or others by being dumb. The more invasive the feature, the bigger the body count. I work in IT, a generally safe profession. A team I used to work on ran a test and commissioning lab, 
When a new system was introduced, we'd build the servers for testing and then use the results to design and commission the production servers. This was before virtualization and the cloud. This meant that there was a degree of doing hardware builds in our job, so we had a crate of tools to open up cases, some of which were specific to the fastenings used by the supplier, so you had to complete a supplier course to be permitted to use. Not usually for safety reasons, they just didn't want any ham-fisted idiot poking around inside, causing support calls because they didn't know what they were doing. The lab was a locked room on the same floor as our office, with a strict rule that anyone not on the team had to be accompanied by a senior member of the team before they entered. The total value of hardware and parts in the lab was a few million pounds, and it also contained the main power distribution panels for the floor. One day we were having some new power points fitted in the main office, taking out singles and replacing them with doubles and running extra cable to supply the extra load. The team deputy manager had accompanied the electrician to turn off the panel he was connecting to, and the one that ran to power to the existing singles. A couple of hours later, a junior member of the team came up looking for the tool crate, which the deputy manager gave him access to, and he took a pair of pliers out. I asked him why he needed pliers, and he just said he needed to get something off of something. I followed him, he went into the test lab, to the power distribution panels, and started to try to remove the electrician working do not touch tags attached to the main breakers. Each switch had a hole near the end that matched up to a hole in the panel. The electrician had run the wires of the rags through these holes. The junior team member was trying to undo the wires. On the panels, the electrician was working on the power points connected to. I stopped him, took the pliers off him, and walked him out to the head of the department's office. That was next to the test lab to report the health and safety violation. This was far from his first failure to follow the rules. His excuse was that he wanted to charge his phone and all the live points near his desk were in use. The team manager and deputy were called in. All he got was a telling off to be more careful in the future. I went and told the electrician what had happened, and he dug a couple of small padlocks out of his toolbox, which is what he should have used to lock the breakers open, not just the twisted wire of the tags, to prevent reoccurrence. Story 3. Oh, hell, my time to shine. I'm a quality assurance manager, and my entire career is in this. Why does this exist? How can this be? Did this not come up in testing? Two options. Number one, yes, it did. We raised it and escalated it, and it was decided that it was worth releasing as nobody gave a poop. So the business pushed it out knowing people might do it, but it would make more money just to release it. Number two, no, we didn't find it because in a room full of very smart people who spent years doing market research and user acceptance testing, with private and public beta releases, nobody thought to do what you just did. Seriously, I love the general public. They think of ways to screw up multi-billion pound platforms in ways we could never have predicted. Number three, legal. This was found and raised, and someone decided that the huge amount of ticked-off users that were massively inconvenienced would not matter compared to the six people that would sue us if it didn't do the thing. Holy poop, I worked for Network Rail, UK Rail Admin, and have info on this too. The reason they're pushing for the split barriers, where one side comes down and then the other a short while later, is because people are stupid enough to try and drive around them. It goes like this. No barriers were in place, equals people drove on and got creamed by a train. So, full barriers across both lines were in place, equals people on the crossing, when it came down, got creamed by a train. So, half barrier on only your side of the road, so people could drive on if they were in the crossing, equals people drove around the half barrier and got creamed by a train. So, delayed full barrier, where your half comes down first, and then a few seconds later the other side comes down, giving people time to move off, but not circumvent it. Equals people realize this, see the flashing red lights, and accelerate into the other lane to try and get around the barrier before it closes. So screw this, I'm out. You think your M badge means you can beat a god dang freight train over a 5 yard space? Go for it. Just remember to adjust your wills to account for the cleanup fee. God dang. I should just get to the end before I rant, but user interface delay tactics, the thing about if I can't see it, it must be broken. ATMs. I worked on these for a couple of years, and I guarantee that whatever transaction you selected was completed within a fraction of the time you think. Want to pay a check-in? Okay. Beep beep. Beepity beep. Beep beep. Done. Those beeps are all fake. We did it 20 seconds ago, but we got sick of people calling to check. It blipped up way too fast. Are you sure it really went through? I don't know how it did it that fast. Loads of transactional data are sent almost instantly, and the user interface you see is just comforting headpaths. Story 4. 
Used to work as a glass dropper, a glazer, in a window factory. Had a large glazing machine that I knew how to run perfectly, tuned to max output, and fix better than maintenance. Most lines had two glass droppers, while I was the only one for my line because I consistently put out 120 plus drops by myself, while the other lines were getting 100 drops on average, and only 120 or more on a really good day with two people. Factory is getting bigger, making more money, so they tell us that they're buying all new automated glazing machines. I flipped my crap and told them they can kiss their high drop output goodbye. They had one of those new and wonderful machines in the middle building already on the picture window line, so I knew how it ran. They promised me that it was faster than any manual operator could be. I told them they were dipdongs. I said what I wanted and did what I wanted because I was too good to fire. This started after I learned I was too good to be promoted, so I figured it must work both ways and was correct. Anyways, the new machines come in, run at a preset speed and 1200 PSI, I could run it 10 times faster manually and knew it could safely handle 2000 PSI. They also had light curtains that made the whole process stop and restart anytime you so much as put a finger through the light curtain. This was so freaking stupid, both because the machine had literally zero parts that could hurt a person, maybe a slightly painful bump to the head if you stuck your face in the way of the nozzle arm, at most, is how non-dangerous it was and also because the fancy, wonderful, automated machine constantly missed the freaking corners, so you had to break the light curtain to fix it. There were many other reasons the light curtain was stupid, but those are the biggest. Anyways, our drop count went from 120 or more to an average of 30. The bosses were ticked off. They tried blaming me because the other lines are doing just fine with the new machines, until I pointed out that the other lines are doing exactly the same as they were before because they suck so much that the machines are basically the same as them. Long story short, there were two of the older machines left that were meant to go to the lowest output lines of older model windows we didn't make much of anymore. One of those machines went to me instead. I heard the CEO, we were getting bigger but still only like a company of around a thousand people, was super ticked off that the third newest line, the M600 line, my line, was back to an older machine. I like to think I'm pretty awesome for getting my way, but the truth is that our particular window design didn't work well with their automated BS anyways. Like I said earlier, it always missed the corners and maintenance couldn't figure out how to fix it, so that was a big part of why I got my way. Story 5. A useful frame of mind when designing industrial machinery is the best place for an e-stop button is a place that you almost always bump into while using the machine. As bad as it is if you have to reach for the e-stop, the worst things happen if you actually have to look for it. If you cannot accidentally hit the e-stop during normal operation, you might have trouble hitting it in an emergency. I operate a mechanical press, but I'm trusted not to stick myself between the dies in normal use and have a crash block to put between the top and bottom when I have to do any work on the tooling. The crash block is tethered to the machine in a way that putting it in place breaks the e-stop chain as an extra layer of safety. The power must be locked out. My particular job allows me the luxury of needing to find the pedal before each press cycle. Other jobs require much tighter timing, so operators run the risk of cycling the press from muscle memory any time that they step towards it. So they have very long brushes to grease things so they can not only do it without sticking in their arms, but they do not have to even step towards the press. As a press operator, you need good impulse control, and we are all inculcated with the fact that if you see something wrong after you start the press cycle, there is nothing that you can do but watch. Hopefully, you will learn something not to do. Someone lost the fingertips of one hand from noticing too late that the part being struck was crooked. Me, I just watch the part and tooling get mangled, explain everything to my supervisor, and wait for the tool setters to replace the broken or bent bits of tooling as I toss the mangled part into the scrap bin. To help with learning from the mistakes of others, short of repeatedly doing the same stupid thing, no mistake will get you terminated, except not wearing your PPE, which will get you fired to keep you safe, so long as you honestly explain what happened. Destroy a press because the crash block tether was long enough to put the crash block in place without untethering it? Sorry that we had to find that out the hard way, but all others will be checked for length. Misguided OHS directive removes all of the tethers, a crash block goes missing, and nobody knows what happened to the press? You bet the liar that feigned ignorance was fired. As everyone was expecting an incident like this to happen, he would not have been blamed for forgetting that placing a crash block no longer disabled the press. Story 6. 
Good computer software has an unbelievable number of sanity checks to make sure the data the users entered aren't fundamentally insane, and error messages for when they are. Just for example, any time the user is allowed to enter a date, it has to be checked to verify that the date actually exists. No 00001334267582. No February 30th, etc. And various other ways the dates could be bonkers. For example, that you aren't scheduling a meeting in the distant past. Numerical data have to be checked to see that they're actually numbers first before checking that the numbers make any kind of sense. A single user entered piece of information can have a dozen or more sanity checks on it individually, and that's before you start checking that the various data aren't nonsense in combination with another. For example, the end date is before the start date. A meeting is scheduled to last 10,000 years, so no one can book conference room 3 for anything else ever again. If the database field for the user's name can only hold up to 65,535 bytes, the program has to actually check that the user didn't enter more than that. It isn't only stupidity you're worried about here. Deliberate attacks that cause problems on purpose can be an issue too. Every single one of these checks needs an error message, and you have to run that error message past several categories of users. Programmers, sysadmins, power users, end users, and abject idiots, to ensure that it's reasonable for all of them. Among other things, this means it has to be unique, attention-grabbing, memorable, and not too scary so that the user will notice the error message, think it's coherent enough to remember, remember it, and report it to the appropriate computer geek, who will then have enough information to diagnose the problem. Ticking all of these boxes at once is a challenge. And yes, somebody will absolutely try to put a hard page break in the middle of a file name, ship a package to a fictional country, and use a proposed emoji character that absolutely no fonts support yet as their username, because of course they will. Story 7. The paper cutter mentioned resurfaced a memory from when I was 19, I'm about 57 now, working the summer between semesters at a bindery that produced softcover books. The machine had a three-foot blade, razor sharp, that trimmed two-foot stacks of tag board used for the book covers. It used 35,000 psi of pressure, if I remember correctly. For safety measures, it had two separate handles above, one for each hand, and a foot pedal. The blade wouldn't cut down diagonally until all three were activated. Cue the idiot. He had rigged the upper handles with an older fashioned clothes hanger. These were the metal ones with a cardboard tube across the bottom. He rigged the handles so that pulling down on the hook of the hanger activated both handles. He was always standing on the pedal. The table of the machine was machined smooth and with the aid of silicon spray made moving the two foot stacks much easier. A two-foot stack of tag board weighs more than you might think. He oversprayed the surface, and while adjusting the stack with his left hand and his right hand on the hanger hook, the stack scooted forward much easier than normal, like a tire hydroplaning on water. This caused him to pull down on the hook of the hanger, and since he always stood on the foot pedal, activated the blade. It went straight through his wrist. The first anybody else knew about it was when we heard something bumping along and accelerating through the ducts of the air vacuum designed to collect all the paper scraps from web presses to binders and dump them into a bailing room. Everyone had to help search the baler for the hand. Very glad I wasn't the one who found it. And I got the visual of the cross-section of a wrist as he stood holding his handless arm and white as a ghost. He never screamed or anything. By the way, it was reattached, but I heard he never could close his hand more than halfway and was fired for bypassing safety measures. Pretty sure the company didn't have to pay for the medical expenses either because of the same reasons. Story 8. When I was in college, my summer job was working at an arboretum as a tree cutter's assistant and heavy equipment operator. Dutch elm disease was a big concern, so in addition to general pruning, the tree crew occasionally had to destroy a stand of trees. The wood chipper we used for this was one of the big jobs fully capable of ingesting entire trees. We'd use a tractor to shove anything under 15 inches in diameter into the machine and just stand back while it sucked 60 plus feet of tree in automatically. If you look at most commercial wood chippers, you'll notice a bar that loops around the outside of the intake. That's not there for reinforcement or to protect the machine. If an operator were to get sucked in, pushing this bar in the direction of travel will stop and or reverse the machine's inlet rollers. I got to experience this firsthand one lovely day. I was following the rules, PPE worn, standing to the side of the chute outside a safety panel, 
except the cuff of my glove got caught on a branch of the limb I was chipping and started to drag me over the top of the safety guard and into the machine. I learned why sometimes these things don't prevent tragedy. Surprise, a bit of pain. I didn't make it to the rollers, so wasn't directly injured by the machine, but sharp wood and getting pulled over a thin metal guard is not comfortable. Disorientation and difficulty getting a hand onto the safety bar meant I was slow to engage the safety. In fact, the seam on my glove failed almost simultaneously with me hitting the bar. Had I not been able to get away, it still would have saved my life, but maybe not my arm. Yeah, some equipment deserves a lot of your respect, or even the best idiot proofing won't save you. Story 9. About Story 5 and the products which are engineered to prevent problems but cause more than they solve, the commenter asks if the engineers propose something, then no one notices it's a failure in quality control. It's usually the other way around. The engineers never propose something. They're tasked to bring several solutions to the table to be implemented. Once approved, quality assurance, QA from now on, tests each solution and finds each solution up and downsides. Usually this leads to several meetings, more testing and redesigns. On one side, you have the engineer saying what is possible, what is viable, and what is practical. On the other side, you have QA and the executives trying to get the upsides of each proposal without any downside whatsoever and accept no compromise. Eventually, a Frankenstein monstrosity emerges with parts of each of the original proposals arranged in a way that QA can cross all the downsides of their list from the very first testing. The product is tested in the most unnatural environment, and there is a deadline to start producing it. So QA never tests it with actual human beings. So for the gas novel, I can see four different solutions implemented at once. Alpha, make the tube in a way that only pours gasoline from a certain angle so that you can't accidentally spill it by kicking or dropping. Beta, push a switch that allows gasoline to pour out. Gamma, same as before with a lever. Delta, pushing down the nozzle to impede gasoline to pour too quickly and air to come inside too fast. All these solutions at once add up to all the upsides in a way that there are no downsides, but since it was never tested with human beings, then they don't know that humans only have two hands and no patience for puzzles when they're on the road. Story 10. Not an engineer, but a lab assistant. As a side task of my job, we often have to prepare and send free samples to clients, and the old procedure was rather rudimentary and also out of date, and seeing how, due to circumstances, I had the most experience and knowledge about the current procedure, I was tasked with rewriting the manual. I tripled the original page amount, and one of the questions I got from a colleague was, aren't you making it a bit too idiot-proof? Is everything really necessary, and isn't it self-evident to do certain things? The joy I had explaining to them the things I added that I never thought I would need to include until someone proved me wrong. I understood their sentiment, surely, but while some things I simply added because they were things I discovered were handy to know, more than a few I wrote down for the sole reason I had seen people do things I used to believe were self-evident as what not to do. Example, check if you have added the right certificates to the package or check if the products you are sending haven't expired yet. But then again, there are also a few things I put in there that are so self-evident when you're experienced with it, like proper fill techniques, that you would forget to teach them to new people, for whom those things aren't yet so self-evident. I do speak from experience on this one, as I also had to be taught and discover these things. Another fun example of, we shouldn't have to explain this to you, but yet here we are was when my colleague who questioned me making it idiot-proof thought it was a good idea to word exactly like that to our supervisor. The supervisor predictably found that wording a bit disrespectful. No crap. Story 11. The feature of power paper cutters is the same feature for veneer cutters in cabinet maker workshops. It takes both hands to first push down the pneumatic press that holds the veneer in place, and then again both hands to lower the long freaking knife that cuts the veneer. But as if that wasn't enough, it also has a line of infrared light beams going back and forth in between the machine, and the machine will refuse to operate if that line is broken. Same goes for industrial CNC machines. There's a mat on the floor. If you step on that mat, the CNC stops working and returns to its home position. All joiners, thickness planers, saws, drills, router tables, etc. also have their stop buttons placed in a way so the operator's body will hit it before they're pulled in entirely. 
Furthermore, several of the smaller machines, such as horizontal drills, table routers, and some of the more specialized machines, also require the continual pressing down of a dead man's switch in order to even start. And that's all just for stationary machines. Handheld power tools have their own way of preventing accidental activation, usually by having a specialized switch which must be pushed down or forward and held in place, in order to even unlock the on and off button. Reason again being that humans are stupid. One of the things I'd love to do as well is to create my own take on industrial machinery and see if I can design a smaller, more affordable version. But I never release the plans, as I know I would have to spend hours designing multiple different safety features just to avoid people messing up their limbs on stuff that should make sense right off the bat. But people are idiots. Story 12. I used to help my friend clean up his workplace at Baldmore's Penn Station located in a community called Station North. Weirdest thing ever having to do with the extremely high-powered suspended electrical lines that power the electrical trains? It's Baltimore City, and pigeons are everywhere. It was March. I'm autistic and hate sudden loud noises. Every so often I'd see a grenade in the place. My friend laughed, saying, oh, that was a pigeon exploding. We went down into the storage room. I saw pigeons sitting on the green, high-powered wire, and nothing happened to them. While I was watching, a stiff, sustained March breeze blew. A brisk breeze blew strong enough to make the assembled pigeons perched safely on the top of the two wires lean backwards. The pigeons would tuck their tail features to maintain their balance on the wire. This leaning back of their tails tucked enough completed the circuit as the pigeon's tucked tail touched the bottom of the two-wire pair as they sat on the topmost wire. The result was a loud boom and a bright blue arc that was momentary. Immediately thereafter came a bright orange-red flash of light where a pigeon once sat. Now there's nothing but an explosion of features, aerosolized pigeon blood, meat, and viscera. Being autistic, I laughed my head off, having seen it happen there not once, but twice. Boom! I actually was asked to leave, because after that day, I laughed like a madman every time a pigeon exploded. Being autistic, I did not make eye contact, and my flat effect made people think that I was always angry. I gave off a serious serial killer vibe, and my insane laugh wherever a pigeon exploded pushed people over the edge. That's how I blew another chance in a situation I hoped would turn into a paying job. Story 13. The industry fields usually require the lockout tagout, LOTO, procedures to be followed by putting a lock on equipment. This is due to experience that even when all safety switches are tripped, a machine can and will still operate if a power source is still available for it to move. This includes air, hydraulic, and electricity. This procedure is only there to prevent the companies from being sued, since the lock on some equipment I've operated doesn't actually lock anything but a door open, and the safety switches on these doors can and often do stop working. We had machines brought in to automate a process, and I can't delve too deep because of a clause in our social media contract. One part of these machines would still move randomly, though they weren't supposed to. That's even with the power off and the e-stop depressed. This type didn't require a low toe to do the typical work listed below. The rule at the start was that we weren't to enter these machines. However, we had to enter them to clear many types of jams, or clean them, so that policy went out the window. It took a few people getting hurt before the maker of these machines had to come in and install parts that would force that part that would move at random instances to hold into its home position, or wherever the machine had it located should it fault out. Funny thing is, I pointed this out when the manufacturer of the machines installed them and was present to show the employees how to use them. That's where the just don't go into it rule came from. Story 14. I worked at a place that used those big paper cutters. There are several safety features in place to keep you safe while using it. The reason there's a lever that you step on is to keep the paper, or whatever you're cutting, in place. The machine won't cut if the protective shield is not down, it just won't do anything. There's also a red beam that if your hand breaks the beam, it won't work. The only thing that I wasn't protected from was the blade. In my store, the blade had slipped below the protective guard and no one noticed. I had a large number of cutting jobs that particular shift. I pulled my hand out of the machine after putting in the project I was working on and almost cut off the nail on my middle finger on my right hand. So yes, there was a safety feature in place to prevent that from happening, but it doesn't work if the safety feature isn't working as it's supposed to. My finger took forever to stop bleeding, but it did. I ended up going to the hospital for treatment only after my shift ended, as my manager didn't bother to come in to check on me. I was working third shift alone. 
The hospital used that glue stuff to seal my nail so it could heal. The crazy part is it didn't cut my nail off, just made a V-shaped cut on my nail. It's sad that it took someone getting hurt to realize that the blade had slipped. Why hadn't the machine been serviced before? Story 15. I've got some funny ones. I work with industrial x-ray equipment. Radiation is dangerous, but only if you're stupid or have malicious intent. A reportable overexposure accident will result in 5 seconds of x-ray exposure if someone is inside. There's not just one safety feature on the machines I use, but seven safety interlocks to prevent our x-ray machines from turning on accidentally. But on a new system that was recently delivered to a customer in Germany, the customer was worried because the two-ton lead-shielded door could be closed by one person. They thought it was dangerous. So they requested we custom add a second safety button to be pressed by a second person. Yep, you have to call a second person just to press a button to close the door. And then there's nothing for the second person to do while you operate the machine. German engineering, I guess. Another one, because sometimes the idiot is me. We were getting a radiation safety audit on a new machine from a state authority when they walk around on a tour and me and my boss are inside of an x-ray machine that a person is not supposed to be able to fit inside of. For safety. It's about the size of a refrigerator. At that exact moment, the owner of our company and the state radiation officer walked up to the machine my boss and I are performing maintenance on, and the look on their faces was priceless. The machine was in maintenance mode with all of the interlocks open, so no danger, but still a funny story. Story 16. As a transportation engineer, I have one word for you. Everything. Yes, everything. I work in an urban, high-crime, and <clears throat> low-intelligence area. Pretty much anything that isn't concrete needs extra hardware to be both vandal-proof, theft-proof, and idiot-proof. In smaller municipalities, public utilities might leave their storm or sewer lids and electric vaults unlocked, but in the big city, they gotta be locked. In case someone drops something into the storm or sewer system, steals the grates, or, God forbid, jumps into a manhole, in service sewer manholes have a lot of toxic gases in them and will kill you pretty quickly if you go in them unprepared. Electrical cabinets will sometimes be installed with anti-graffiti coaling. Most newer small street signs have breakaway foundations in case an idiot runs into them to prevent said idiot from getting hurt. Flashing beacons became a thing for mid-block crossings because idiots don't pay attention to just street signs and don't understand that you give way to pedestrians at designated crossings. Extruded curbs exist so idiots will flip their vehicles before they run over a pedestrian or get into a head-on collision. Sidewalk bulb-outs, sidewalk extensions, became a thing so idiots would slow down at intersections and not cut curbs. Rumble strips cost to get the attention of idiots who drive drunk or tired or distracted. I can easily think up some more things, but you get the idea at this point. Transportation engineering is a never-ending struggle to affordably idiot-proof as much of our infrastructure as we can. Story 17. When I did phone tech support for Philips CD recorders, I learned to tell customers to swap ends on the SCSI cable, even though the two ends were identical, in order to more reliably fix the problem of poorly seated connectors. This is because when I told people that they needed to open up their computer and really make sure that both ends of the cable were firmly seated, what many of them would actually do was put the phone down, do nothing for a few minutes, then come back and lie that they'd opened their computer and pushed on the cable heads like I asked just flatly lie. So I had to trick all the customers with a bit of voodoo magic in order to get compliance from the liars who didn't believe I knew what I was talking about, and in their sole wisdom deciding that unseated connectors were not a thing, declining to do what would have solved their issue, and then lying about it. Okay, I need you to swap ends on the cable, and while you're doing that, make really sure you press the connectors all the way, on both sides, so they're completely flush. Secret success! This defeated their technical knowledge and got them to actually comply. I can just imagine people telling their computer-savvy friends how to fix SCSI cables by swapping ends and being told they're full of crap, but exclaiming, but the tech support guy had me do it and it fixed the problem. Story 18. I worked for AOL's help desk years ago. We'd remote into people's computers to remove malware, mostly elderly people who paid $19.99 to $59.99 per month to basically have us on call to fix their computers. Similar to what the scam tech support companies pretend to be, but we were actually legit. Our customers called us, not the other way around. 
I know AOL is viewed as somewhat of a joke, but my customer satisfaction rating was over 99%, and we didn't just run defrag and fake the work. I actually walked a few people through advanced manual malware removal, resoldering their motherboards, etc. Yes, we had some tech lackeys employed to handle the trivial crap, but we also had real technicians on staff, not Geek Squad level idiots. The AOL name really did us a disservice, reputation-wise. We had some great people there. A lot of what we did was run in the background with scripts I'd written, faster than technicians doing it manually. These scripts cut our time per ticket by 90%, but we received a ton more complaints about the service because A. You couldn't have fixed all the problems that fast. B. Yeah, I didn't see anything happen on my screen. You're being lazy. Old people can be dumb, but if they understood how any of it worked, they wouldn't be calling us, so I can't complain too much. Story 19. Engineers aren't perfect at all. Far from it. I work with industrial and commercial insulation, none of that residential crap. My stuff requires a regulated amount of space to be clear around things I insulated, only a couple of inches. With that much explained, I regularly, 70 to 90% of the time, find that I often am not given enough space to properly apply insulation to the things I insulate, mostly piping. Now, I used to blame the tin bashers or the electricians because that is usually whose crap is in my way. However, I eventually started to check just not my schematics, but the charts from the other crews as well. What I have found is that it's almost never the tin bashers or the electricians' fault at all. It's the engineer who created the schematics in the first place. 10% of the time, I see the charts show my required space. The rest of the time, I have to either bend, cut, break someone else's work, or my own in order to at least make it look like that pipe is insulated, all because the engineer couldn't use his crayons properly. There are buildings I've done that will probably need black mold removed from it because an engineer's oversight caused my insulation to not have proper space to function properly. Once these hot pipes have cold air touch them, you get condensation. Over time, that soaks the inside of walls and grows mold, makes people sick. I see these issues in many commercial buildings open to the public where I'm from. Story 20. Banks chaining their pens to keep people from walking off with them. We had a pen thief in our small business. Everyone in the office complained about their pens slowly disappearing. I got fed up with it and created labels so each person's pen had their name on it. A few days later, the president of the company came to me and sheepishly said that she had just discovered she was the pen thief. She was using a pen, then realized it had the name of someone she'd just visited. She apparently had a habit of fiddling with pens on people's desks when she visited them to talk, then would walk off with the pen. The extra pens in her office, she assumed others were leaving when they had a meeting with her, and she'd just been putting them back in the supply closet. We had a similar problem with the electric golf carts. People would check them out, use them, check them in, but not return the key. Someone else would try to use the golf cart and find the key missing. We'd check the log, find the last person to use it, and call them at home asking them to bring the key back. Eventually, we set it up so you had to exchange your car keys to get a golf cart key. That way, anyone who forgot to return a golf cart key would get in their car to drive home, then realize they didn't have their car keys, but they still had a golf cart key. Story 21. When I worked in a factory, some machines I worked with had a light curtain for safety. A lot of girls work in the area, and there was always the issue that some girls' boobaloobaloobies would set off the sensor while breathing. If the sensor went off you, it would stop your station, the person on the other side, and two people on another machine. Another had a few second delay that would cause people to set the sensors off, but that was pretty easy to reset. The other would take five plus minutes to reset and fix. The company didn't want to properly fix it because it would cost money. Another machine had thumb sensors that wouldn't lock unless your resting thumb was in the left sensor. It only ran if both thumbs were in the sensors. I'm left-handed and would have so many issues with the left-hand only thing. Honestly, that factory is stuff that they make medical parts, but let too many bad parts pass. One of the higher-ups has been heard saying that as long as the numbers look okay this year, we can pay the I'm sorry fees the following year. I have two friends in shipping there who are often overwhelmed with returns of bad parts, which I'm pretty sure just get thrown out. Story 22. The artificial sounds are a good one. Lots of places do that. If you walk into a casino, a good portion of the ringing and jangling you hear is just the machines making those sounds because it signals to other people that there's a whole lot of winning going on. I tend to avoid these places since I have really sensitive hearing, to the point that I've heard a wasp chewing on a dry twig from inside my garage about 50 feet away. That said, my sister invited me to this funhouse place about an hour south for a round of mini golf. Sounded like fun, so I joined in. 
We got done with the golf. I won. My first game, too. And went to the big structure that had an arcade and a food court. Just a place of fun and whimsy, really. We were sitting on a bench, letting the kids play around, and I feel that there's something off. I get up, pace around, and home in on the noise that was coming from a speaker right above us. The sound of ringing machines, voices, and laughter. I always had to wonder what the place would have really sounded like without the artificial sounds of fun being pumped into the building. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.